Our scripture reading this morning is one that's very, very well known, yet it's very, very personal. Please listen carefully as we read from John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. May God bless the reading of this scripture. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Uh, a great deal has been said about it's good to see so many of you, and it is a good, uh, good to see so many of you who are returning, but I want to say it's good to hear so many of you that are returning. I'm hearing voices that I haven't heard in a long time in our worship. I'm hearing uh, beautiful tenor voices like, like David Bates and, and Gary McClish, people like that. I'm so glad to be among all of you today to hear those wonderful things. And that means, guys, I don't have to try to sing tenor. And that's a great thing uh, if we've got them here. So it's, it's wonderful to see everybody. Yesterday, if you were not able to attend the memorial service for Dan Camp, you really missed out on a very special time for our congregation. We, we were uh, blessed to have our brother Barry Baggett, who we support uh, in, in the French-speaking world, to say some wonderful things about Dan and Sue, about the work that has gone on here for so long uh, that he has been blessed to be a part of. We were blessed to hear our friend and our brother, Dr. Bert Alexander. There is an old saying that says, you can't make new old friends. And that's how I feel about my brother Bert. It was, it was good uh, to see them. Uh, Greg did a wonderful job in leading us in the songs that, that Dan and Sue had picked out for this uh, great service we had yesterday. If you weren't able to be here for that, it is online. You can go back and you can watch that service and enjoy that time celebrating that family. And we do need to continue to celebrate that family. We need to continue to lift up Sister Sue as she learns to live without her other half. And so we are blessed to be here today. We are going to continue in our study with the book of Hebrews today. That was Dan's favorite book in the Bible. I didn't know that until recently, but I'm glad that we're able to study this great book together. Something has become very apparent to me, though, as I have been studying through the book of Hebrews for this sermon series, and that is this, that there are many people, when they get ready to study the book of Hebrews, that they begin in the first chapter and they start working through that first chapter, and they realize that so much of the first, uh, pretty much four chapters of the book of Hebrews are predicated upon the Old Testament. There's a lot of reference back to the Psalms, there's a lot of uh, reference back to the prophets, and people have this idea that since we're under the New Covenant, that we don't need to worry about the things that were said in the Old Testament. And for that reason, they kind of blaze through those first few chapters very quickly. But I have come to realize <clears throat> in our study of the book of Hebrews that those first few chapters of that great book are pivotal to our understanding of the rest of that great book. That those first few chapters remind us that we are the spiritual Israel. We are no longer the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. We are the church. We are those who have come into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ and had our sins washed away. But our spiritual ancestors from the nation of Israel teach us so much about what it means to be God's people. Oftentimes when people are studying through the book of Hebrews, they will run right through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and most of chapter 4 until they get to the passage we're going to look at today. Join me in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14, where the writer says, Since then... 
we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Three verses. Three verses is all we're going to look at today for the most part. And in those three verses, we learn a great deal about who Jesus is. In those three verses, we learn a great deal about how much Jesus loves us. In those three verses, we start to understand what John wrote when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son. That's what you learn in those three verses. And I hope today that you will attain our goal of seeing Jesus as our high priest and honoring him as our high priest in every aspect of our lives. We do have a high priest. And that's a concept that sometimes is a little bit difficult for us because in our system of belief, we don't think that much about a priest or about priesthood, which is unfortunate because according to the Apostle Peter, those of us who were baptized, those of us who were added to the church by Christ, those of us who have had our sins washed away are a part of a priesthood. And not just any priesthood, but a royal priesthood. And in that priesthood of which we who are believers belong to, there is one high priest. And his name is Jesus Christ. The idea of a high priest goes back to our spiritual ancestors, to those in the Old Testament, to the children of Israel. The high priest was someone who was highly respected. The high priest once a year would enter into the Holy of Holies and he would make atonement for the sins of the people. He was someone to be respected, but he was someone who was just a man. He was someone that was among the people. He was someone that was flawed. But our high priest is perfect. Our high priest doesn't have to go just once a year to the Holy of Holies. Our high priest dwells in heaven at the right hand of God and atones for our sins through his blood every day of our lives. In the book of Zechariah, <clears throat> the prophet said, it is, he, <clears throat> it is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. This is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only high priest who has ever been high priest and king. Jesus is the only Messiah who could do that because he is the only high priest who is without sin. He is the chosen son of God. And we get to worship him. We get to walk daily with our high priest. Our high priest is not some far-off person. Our high priest is not someone that rides around in a special automobile or wears special clothes. Our high priest is the Son of God. Our high priest wants to know us more and more, and he wants us to know him more and more. Our high priest has passed through the heavens. No other high priest could ever say that. Now, they did go once a year into the Holy of Holies. They did make that sacrifice for God's people, but they had not passed through the heavens. Only Jesus can say that. And there are many parallels between an earthly high priest and our great high priest, Jesus Christ, the, the largest being that atonement for sin. But you see, the high priest in the, for the children of Israel would go into that Holy of Holies once a year, and he would make that blood sacrifice, and it, it was an atone, atonement for sin. But Jesus' blood sacrifice was once for all. He, didn't have, he doesn't have to do it every year. He doesn't have to go to a place every year because his sacrifice was greater than anyone else. He passed through the heavens. He is with God at his very right hand, and he is interceding on our behalf. And that's something we should be excited about. We should be excited that our high priest is superior to any high priest 
who has ever lived. We should be excited about those things and share those things with those whom we meet. And it is Jesus Christ who is that high priest. You see, the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to a predominantly uh, large, formerly Jewish audience. He's writing to a group of people who had been a part of that Jewish faith, a group of people who would have looked up to that high priest, a group of people that understood that concept of a physical high priest. And he understood that they might struggle just a little bit with wanting to go back to what was so familiar to them that they might have wanted to go back to that old system of belief because they could see their high priest. They, they knew that high priest. And really, we have the same problem in our lives today. Those of us who have become Christians, those of us who have put on Christ in baptism, there are times when we are tempted to go back to what was familiar to us. For some people, that might mean bad habits. For some people, that might mean bad relationships. For some, it might be living a life that looks good to the rest of the world, but turning our back on Jesus Christ, our high priest. Just because we physically cannot see <clears throat> our high priest does not mean that our high priest <clears throat> is not living and active. It does not mean that our high priest does not care about us. Jesus Christ is our high priest, and he is a great high priest. He is the best high priest that has ever been because he is the son of God. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And we should be thankful for that and sharing that with those whom we meet. For a moment, I want you to think about when you put Christ on in baptism. Those of you that have made that decision. Those of you that haven't made that decision, we'd like to talk to you about that. We'd like to, to help you come to that decision. But those who have made that decision, those who put on Christ in baptism, I just for a moment want you to think about what that looked like. Were you in a room like this, surrounded by people who loved you and cared about you? Were you at a neighbor's swimming pool with a group of small family and friends? Were you at a church camp and maybe in a natural body of water, a lake or a river, or a stream, something of that nature? Do you have that picture in your mind of what it looked like to put on Christ in baptism? It doesn't matter where we put on Christ in baptism. There is a common thread that runs through that. And it is that when we put on Christ in baptism, when we are immersed in that watery grave of baptism beforehand, we make a confession. We confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We confess Him as the Lord of our lives. We express our belief, as we talked about from John chapter 3, that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. But the problem is, sometimes we get in our minds that we made that confession when we were baptized and that we don't need to continue making that confession. But the writer of the book of Hebrews would tell us that we must hold fast to our confession. That we must live lives that share that confession with those whom we meet. That we must, among one another, share that confession of the great high priest, Jesus Christ that he is the Lord of our lives, and that outside of Jesus Christ, we are eternally lost. We must be willing to hold fast to that confession, to share that confession with those whom we meet. And the high priest is there to assist us. The high priest is not far off. Now, I say that, and you're saying, well, the high priest is in heaven. Yes, he is in heaven. But we also know that we all carry around with us a little piece of that high priest. We are told in Scripture that when we are baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus is Spirit as well. We are told <clears throat> by, in Paul's letters that we carry around with us in jars of clay this wondrous thing. And it is that little piece of Jesus that we all carry around with us, that high priest. As we partook in the Lord's Supper today, my mind was drawn to the fact that we symbolically are eating the body of our high priest, that we are drinking the blood of our high priest when we partake in the Lord's Supper. And therefore, we must hold fast to our confession. We must share that with everyone whom we meet, that Jesus Christ is the great high priest. This week, my dad helped lay to rest the last secretary that he ever employed. Her name was Denise. And, and Denise 
was one of the best secretaries you've ever met. I never knew another secretary that could have someone sitting at her desk telling them everything that's going on in their lives while at the same time having someone on the phone doing the same thing and sitting at a computer and putting things in to get their insurance taken care of for them. That was Denise. Denise loved everybody. But this week we had to say goodbye to Denise after a long battle with cancer. Yesterday we said goodbye to our brother Dan Camp. And that was difficult in, in many ways. Now, in many ways it was such a, a sweet release and we were so glad that he has claimed that Sabbath rest that we read about in the book of Hebrews, but in a way it was, it was sad. I, I've been finding myself have to, having to sympathize with people quite a bit lately because of the losses in their lives. And I want to confess to you this morning, I'm not always the best at sympathizing. See, there are times when someone needs to be sympathized with, and I think what I need to do is to share some words of encouragement with those people, when in reality, what I need to do is just sit there and be quiet and be with them. There are times when I want to point out the, the silver lining in the gray cloud in their lives, when, when in reality, I just, I just need to be in that moment and to be there with those people. I'm not always the best at sympathizing, but, but do you know who is the best at sympathizing? Our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Because you see, Jesus was one of us. He was a human. He lived in a family. He had brothers and sisters. He, he was one of us. And because of that, he can sympathize with us. You know, the thing about the, the Jewish high priest was they were revered. They were set apart from the rest of Jewish society. They were held up on a pedestal. But Jesus, in many ways, was just like us. He came from a, a pretty poor family. He did not have a lot of luxuries in his life. He knew difficulty, and he knew hardship, he knew temptation. But he was above all of that. He was king and priest at the same time. He was deity and human at the same time. But the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he took the form of a servant. That's an amazing example from our high priest. And he sympathizes with us. He sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. Jesus slept and he ate, and he walked, and he worked, and he did all of the things that we do. He would have experienced all the range of human emotion that we experience. He would have experienced all the range of weakness that we experience. And yet, Jesus will still manage to be above that weakness. He still managed to show us how to deal with those weaknesses. But I am thankful that the high priest that we serve understands our weaknesses. I'm thankful that the high priest that we serve cared enough about us to come and to experience our weaknesses. And he did so in a very good way. We know that he was tempted. We know uh, from our small group study last week, if you were to go to the book of Matthew, you would see that Jesus was tempted. Jesus, our high priest, was tempted. We know that Satan appeared to him. We know that Satan appealed to him, and that he was tempted, and yet he did not sin. And I think sometimes people get hung up on this because they read this passage, they go back to the book of Matthew, they read about Jesus being tempted, and they say, well, yeah, but if I was the Son of God, I, I could do that too. I could live a sinless life as well. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus set an example for us in the way that he dealt with Satan. Jesus was able to be tempted by Satan without sin, and, and Satan appealed to Jesus' basest human desire for hunger, for power, to test God. These are all very, uh, very real things that we deal with, and yet Jesus was without sin. Well, how was Jesus without sin? Every time that Satan appealed to Jesus, Jesus refuted Satan with God's word, with the book of Deuteronomy, specifically in this case. And we have that same ability. We can use God's word to refute Satan. But I want to tell you this morning that we are imperfect, at least I am, and I make mistakes, and I do not always live out the example of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. 
But here's the wonderful thing about our great high priest, Jesus Christ. When I don't live out that example, when I fail, when I stumble and I fall, Jesus is there at the right hand of God and he is interceding on my behalf. He is lavishing the gift of grace upon me. And he does it for the rest of us as well. And if that's the case, and I do believe that is the case, why in the world are we not holding fast to our confession and sharing about our great high priest, Jesus Christ? Why, when we, we hear someone say, nobody understands me, nobody cares about me, nobody cares what happens to me in my life, why don't we say, I care about you, I sympathize with you, I've been tempted and I have sinned, but I know someone who hasn't. And I know someone who will always care about you. I know someone who will never forget you. I know someone that can help you through the darkest of days. His name is Jesus Christ. He is my high priest. He wants to be your high priest. I don't know why we don't do that. It's simple enough if we believe that Jesus Christ is our high priest. I'm not sure I've ever seen in the state of Texas in the month of May temperatures in the 50s until last week it was downright cold a couple days last week i don't like the cold very much and i found myself wanting to maybe draw near to my family to stay warm to, to get some warmth after being outside when it was cold the writer of the book of hebrews encourages us to draw near to our great high priest now we can't physically draw near to our great high priest he's not with us anymore physically but we can absolutely draw near to our high priest spiritually. We can absolutely draw near. And, and it's not that we have to come and beg to draw near to Christ, because quite the opposite is true. Christ begs that we draw near to him. Christ came and lived that sinless life as an example for us, for our benefit, so that we would want to draw near. And the writer of the book of Hebrews gives us some very practical ways that we can draw near to him the writer of the book of Hebrews says that we should draw near to Christ with confidence. The, I, I think about the original audience that, that heard this letter, or read this letter for the first time, and what they must have thought of when they were thinking about drawing near to Christ with confidence. I think about the fact they would have known that Christ was a different kind of high priest. You see, Christ wasn't a Levite. The priests were all Levites, not Christ. Christ was from the line of Judah. He was in the line of David. He was in the line of a man after God's own heart, the king of the nation of Israel. And that would have inspired confidence in those people. Now, let's be honest. We, we don't really care about lineage the way a first century Jewish Christian would care about lineage. But it should say something to us about Jesus being of that line. It should say something to us about the confidence that should inspire in us. We should be willing to draw near to Christ and have confidence that Christ never moves, that he is always there, that he is rock solid, that he is not going anywhere. He is immovable. And we should approach him with confidence. We should approach him in confidence when we pray because he is going to shower mercy upon us. I was so thankful for Herman's prayer. In fact, Really, this morning, I, I wish we would have just sung an invitation and left after Herman's prayer this morning, because it was amazing to talk about and hear about the Holy Spirit. It was amazing to hear about the grace that God provides for us. Grace is the unmerited favor of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grace is something that cannot be bought. It is not something that can be earned. It's something that we really don't even understand fully all the time. And because of that grace... We are shown mercy from God. It is because of that grace that Jesus came and that he died on a cross and that he is our high priest that we can draw near with confidence. It is because of that grace that, that when we pray, as Paul says, the Holy Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with words and utterances that human ears cannot understand. We have confidence that God hears us because Jesus is our high priest and Jesus atones for our sins. We can have confidence in the mercy and the grace of our high priest, Jesus Christ, because he's there to provide help for us. In the last year, I've seen people provide help in ways 
I've never seen before. There are people in this community that are able to have fresh fruits and vegetables because all of you decided we needed to help this community. I love to hear what, what Herman said again about how he and Tommy have been so blessed by this community of believers and the help that they have provided. That help comes through our high priest, Jesus Christ. That help is us being the hands and feet of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Are you starting to see that even though Christ is not with us physically, that he never left us? That he is right here with us. That he indwells in us, and when we allow him to work through us, he will do amazing things. I am thankful for the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. I am thankful for the mercy and the grace that he showers upon us. I am thankful that help is never far away. That he is always there with, an open, with open arms, ready to receive us. That he's ready with a hand to lift us up. That's our high priest. That's Jesus Christ. I'm sorry that we don't think about priests more than we do because we are part of that royal priesthood. I'm, I'm very sorry that we don't give Jesus his proper place as our high priest. But you know, I think that's how Satan wants it. I think Satan wants us to think of Jesus as just another good man, as just another good teacher. I, I think Satan is even okay with us thinking of Jesus as the Son of God, but he doesn't want us to think of him as our high priest because once we put Jesus in those terms, we have no option but to surrender our will to him. And that's the last thing Satan wants. He wants us to hold on to our will. He wants us to be in that weak spot so he can exploit that weak spot. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ is our high priest. And we deserve, he deserves to be in that place in our lives. We deserve, as a fellowship, to love him because he has told us we are there to love him and to come before him. This morning, if you want Jesus to be your high priest, you must put Jesus on in baptism. You must have your sins washed away. If you've not done that yet, we would love to talk to you about that. If you're ready to make that decision, we will stay as long as we need to today in order to make sure that that happens. Maybe you're here today and you've made that decision. Maybe as I asked you to think about that today, you remembered when you made that great decision, when you put on Christ in baptism, but, but perhaps you have allowed Satan to win this little battle in your life and you've started to not think of Jesus as your high priest, but to think of him just another good man, just another good teacher, maybe even the Son of God. And today, you want to make that right. I'm here to tell you the high priest is ready to make that right. The high priest is ready to receive you. This church is ready to help you. We're ready to pray with you. We're ready to do whatever it takes to help you to put God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit back in the right place in your life. If you are tuning in via our live stream today, we know that there's a lot of struggles in this world. We know that you need help as well. There are some points of contact on your screen. If you will reach out to us, I promise you that we will do our best to help meet your needs. We will help you to come to know Jesus the high priest. Today, if you are present in this audience and you need to make a response of faith, if you need to ask for prayers, we're going to give you that opportunity now as we stand and as we sing. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let us pray.